Hey everyone, welcome back to Dan91's Garage. And on this episode, we're going to talk about the parametric output options for the Debt 3 piggyback ECU. If you haven't seen my early videos on the Debt 3, I'll put a link up in this corner and that'll help get everyone up to speed. So we're going to talk about what a parametric output option is and how to set up some simple examples with an LED or a buzzer. So without further ado, let's get straight to it and I'll see you on the computer. Okay, then in you go. So we fired up the Debt 3 tuning software. And as we can see, because we've changed the default scales, it's already pulled in the correct scales for our analog sensors. And now we just load a project, which was video test map. So now that's switched us over. So we're using the correct analog signals for our axis. So basically, the parametric outputs are just a switch. So you use certain conditions to switch a signal to ground, to power accessories, and any other auxiliary components you want. So I'll show you the wiring. What you need to do is connect pin 19 of the DET3 unit to a chassis ground because that's what you'll be grounding any of the equipment through. And you need to connect whatever item you want to be grounded through pin 18. So in the first example, we're using an LED with a 330 ohms resistor. And that's obviously connected to a 12 volt switch source on pin 18. You can connect these items directly to the DET3 if they draw less than five amps. If they draw more than five amps, you'll need to connect them with a relay. So I'll just pop up a list of the top 10 accessories that can be controlled through the parametric outputs. And now we'll have a look at my favorite five and how to set them up using the parametric output configurations. So we'll start off with the most simple one and that's gonna be a shift light. So if we go into the parametric output configuration, this is the table where you choose First of all, the source. So for a shift light, we're obviously gonna to need to use the RPM signal as its source, and that's coming from the IGT wire we intercepted to retard the ignition. The condition will be more than or less than, so obviously we want it to be more than 6,000 RPM. And if we put in here the histogram of 200, what well that means is when the RPM has the condition of more than 6,000 RPM, it will illuminate the LED by switching it to ground. Then 200 RPM below 6,000, so when we drop down to 5,800, it will open the connection and turn the LED off. That's what the histogram does. So that's the first one. Okay, so for our second example, we can set it up also as a boost light. So on the glands, obviously, there are three little green LEDs or three little green bulbs in the rev counter, and they illuminate with different stages of boost. So what we can do is set up our own boost light. Again, with the LED connected, as shown in the uh, first wiring diagram. This time, we're going to use analog in on number one because that was our map sensor that we intercepted to adjust the fueling. So that will tell us when we come on boost and when we need to illuminate the LED. So again, and log in on one, which is our map sensor, has the condition of more than, we need to adjust the figure here until we see our zero bar of boost. So when the map sensor has more than 2.4 volts, which equates to zero bar in the manifold, it will then illuminate the LED. What we can also do is we can set it up as a warning if we want. So rather than having an ice light that tells us when we're having any type of boost, what we can do is increase this until we end up, for example, at 0.7 bar. So if we only ever want to run 0.6 bar, we know that when that light comes on, we're over boosting. So you can set those up as warnings as well. Moving on from that, we can also do that with the intake air temp sensor. So you can replace the LED with a buzzer. So it'll give you an audible warning when the intake air temps are too hot 
and the piggyback ECU is starting to pull the timing. So I'm going to change the setup of this from the last video to a generic 5 volt scale. So we go to scales configuration and I was originally using a GM temp sensor as the scale but I don't know if that's the same calibration as the one in the car. So if we switch that to a 5 volt linear scale that will show it as 0 to 5 volts which is what these sensors are. So we'll also save that as our video test scales. So every time the program fires up, it will now be using that scale. We also need to show all of the sensor because it was limited. So we'll now increase that back up to five volts. And now we can see naught to five volts here. So on the Toyota Starlet, the intake air temp sensor, the higher the intake air temperature, the lower the resistance of the sensor. Therefore, the higher the intake air temperature, the higher the voltage will be shown to the ECU. So we now know that this end is the hot end of the scale. So if we switch to the ignition map, we can now see that we were pulling out timing down this end, which is all a bit backwards. So we'll switch that back to naught. And obviously the hotter it gets, the higher the voltage, the lower it is, the lower the voltage. So once we find out what four volts is, for example, in intake air temp, let's say that that's the point at which we want to pull out some timing. So from four volts onwards, we're gonna pull out an extra two degrees of timing now. So we go to parametric output configuration. So our source is gonna be analog in on number four. When the condition is more than four volts, because that's the voltage we've chosen to start pulling timing, it will switch to ground and sound the buzzer. So now we know that when the piggyback ECU is pulling timing, we hear an audible warning, so we know to calm down a bit. So let's just do a silly one to show you some of the other options. So if we wanna set up nitrous activation, for example, that's gonna to need to be wired in with the relay, obviously, because the uh, pulse always will draw more current than five amps. And usually they're triggered with a micro switch on the throttle body. What we can do is if we tap into the throttle position sensor, we can then switch that relay to ground using the TPS signal rather than a micro switch. So if we pop into this again, and you can select more than one source, you can select up to three. So for nitrous, you're obviously gonna want the throttle to be at least sort of 80% open or more, and the RPMs to be higher than say half of its range. So we'll say 3000 for this example. You definitely don't want to be firing nitrous at a closed throttle at idle because you will blow up your manifold. So, so if you have the normal depth three unit, you won't have the inbuilt map sensor on analog two. So we can now use that to splice into the TPS. You can use a linear percent scale to show the percentage of throttle opening. However, that is obviously related. Zero volts is closed, five volts is fully open. And for the starlet, when the throttle is fully closed, it's 0 0.6 volts output. And when it's fully open, it's four volts output. So what I'm going to use is the five volt linear scale for this example, because we know that four volts is actually full throttle, not five. So we'll OK that. So we're going to the parametrics again. So our first source is gonna be analog in on number two. And our second source is gonna be RPM. And that comes from the IGT wire that we intercepted to control the ignition. So we spliced in the TPS. So the condition is more than say three and a half volts because we know that full throttle is four volts. And when the RPM is more than 3000, it will switch the relay to ground, which will fire the nitrous and fuel solenoid, introducing the mixture into the intake stream. So on this setup, there have to be two conditions fulfilled, and that's using the AND command. So in this final example, we're gonna look at water meth injection. So 
If the engine's not limited or there's a risk of detonation with high intake temps and too high a compression ratio, for example, what we can do is spray in water meth. Now, obviously there are dedicated standalone systems that are able to do it progressively. So if, for example, there's only a risk of detonation above a certain boost pressure with high intake temps, you can set up a pretty simple on-off setup just to spray it in, in a small area where you're getting into trouble. So, so for this setup, we're gonna go with a map sensor, which we intercepted on analog one. And we're also gonna need the intake air temp sensor. So obviously you're not gonna to need to spray meth in when you're off boost. So once you've been caning it and you lift off the throttle and you're now coasting along and there's only vacuum in the manifold, you're under very light load. So there'll be a low risk of detonation. So there's no need to be spraying the meth in. So we'll have that when the map sensor has a condition of more than, for example, half a bar, because below that in this example, we weren't experiencing knock, so we only need it when we get to half a bar or above. And the intake air temps, which is a voltage, let's say that that's four volts again, because that's where we've been pulling out timing anyway. It will then connect the relay, which will fire the pump to inject the water meth into the intake stream. So that's it. A few simple examples with an LED or a buzzer and some comedy examples there of nitrous and water meth. That's just a quick look at it. There's any anything electrical that does or doesn't need a relay can be powered by this, whether it's, like I said before, cooling fans, extra fuel pumps, intercooler spray so you can spray cold water on the front of your intercooler for example you can hook into a coolant temp sensor and just use that as a warning light you can also hook into obviously a fuel pump if you want to stage in a second fuel pump so based on perhaps the boost pressure so when you get to maybe half a bar of boost you can then connect a relay which will fire up a second pump to make extra fuel available if you're going to suddenly start dumping in fuel from a second set of injectors I mean, the possibilities are endless. So there's just a couple more things to show you here. Obviously, when you're using this, this uses up the pin in position power output two. So that is related to the PWM table two. So obviously on PWM table one, we're gonna have our boost solenoid, which is obviously gonna be mapped boost versus RPM. But because we're now using a parametric output on power output two, we then lose this entire table feature. So there we have it, that's my top five. Thanks for watching. There is obviously only one output that you can use, so you need to choose wisely. Let me know down in the comments which one you'd choose for your build. My name's Dan, this is Dan91's Garage. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode.